Thanks for that, Jeff. I'm always a little bit wary when people start running over the places I've worked in or haven't worked in. It always sounds as if I'm someone who can't hold down a job. But uh, at any rate, I've had a, a little bit of a trajectory, all right, a little bit of a travel around um, Galway, Dublin, Aberdeen, sometime in the US as well. Perhaps that might be a key to some aspects of the way I address the problem of writing a history of Ireland. Um, as Jeff said, I've just published it last year. It begins in 431 and it concludes in 2010. Um, 431 is the first recorded date in Irish history. That is the first date for which we have literary evidence. And as a historian, that's what I work with. I work with, with documents, I work with lit literary evidence. Doesn't mean that I have no respect for the archaeologists. Um, it doesn't mean that I ignore their work. It just means that I had to start somewhere, and 431 seemed to be as good a place as anywhere. Um, what I wanted to do then was to, once you decide to do something like that, you have to figure out how you're going to go about it. Um, you just can't write one thing after another. You can't do a chronicle. You can't do an annal. You can't have entries for each year for the next 1,600 years or so. What I tried to do was to jot down a few patterns, I think, that I might like to investigate, to look and see if there, are, uh, if there are overarching themes in Irish history which might make sense of that period, those 1600 years, or make sense of long periods within that period, some, several centuries at a time. It's an opportunity for a historian to you know, observe the long periods of time without the sort of narrow specialisation, which I've done in my previous books of looking over two or three years in fairly atomised detail. This is a chance to look at really the broad sweep of Irish history and see what sense you can make of it. So what I tried to do then was to come up with a number of themes which seemed to me to make sense of Irish history, or at least which helped to understand that long period of time. The first of these, the first theme which I came on, I suppose, would be the very obvious one of Ireland and England. That is to say that this has been a recurring theme in Irish history, that is, that from the time of St. Patrick right down to 2010, Ireland and England seem to be locked at, to, at, to some extent in some sort of eternal conflict. There seems to have been some sort of engagement, some sort of contestation for the last 1600 years. You could argue, it has been argued, very often in a polemical fashion, that doesn't entirely rule it out as being admissible, that the central theme of Irish history has been the struggle to set up an independent sovereign Ireland, and that the chief obstacle to that has been England, and that this has been a, a, a theme which has been pursued through the centuries from 1200 on, maybe perhaps even before. This notion of setting up a, a single unitary state is something which um, seems to offer that overarching theme with which we can work and in which we can try and fit the events of Irish history. The evidence for this, of course, would be the multiple revolts of which we've heard quite a bit during today, though I didn't expect to hear about 1641 and 1690 and 1798 and Robert Emmett and so on and so forth. That these, have been, these are the, the building blocks with which to construct the, the overarching theory of perennial conflict between England and Ireland. The difficulties in the way of this, though, the difficulties in accepting this as a central theme, I think, are many. Um, one just basic one, because I'll have to move on, one of the difficulties is that many of the, the, the rebels of the period from the 1580s through the 1640s, 1690s, and so on, many of these rebels regarded themselves as not rebels at all. They regarded them, themselves as rebels on behalf of the king. They regarded themselves as conservative rebels. They saw they did not seem to have any aspiration to sort of separate Ireland from England and set up an independent Irish Republic or anything of that sort. That does appear in 1798 with Theobald Wolfe Tone and the United Irishmen, and obviously also with Robert Emmett. But then for, for most of the 19th century, the whole, the whole idea is rather with mending the union between England and Ireland rather than ending it. And then this physical force separatism gets another rebirth, if you like, in 1916 in the 20-year period of militarisation in Irish history, in a wider European militarisation. But it doesn't carry the theme that we're looking for all the way through. There are certain problems with it. There is another aspect to the Anglo-Irish relationship, away from the strictly political one, that is worth investigating.
And that is, the, I think, the idea that I've tried to look at from time to time, um, perhaps more, with more emphasis in certain periods, is this, the theme of a colonial connection between England and Ireland, that Ireland as a colony of England. Famously, the first colony, Robert Frame, Robin Frame has written a wonderful text on colonial Ireland in the early medieval period, um, and very many historians have argued that the essential connection between England and Ireland is the colonial nexus, very evident in the 18th century it has been argued, where Ireland looks like one of the British colonies in North America, looks like one of the British colonies in the West Indies, Jamaica, New York, Massachusetts, similar sort of colonial governors coming and going, uh, English Privy Council, great deal of insight and so on, and generally the, the metropolitan condescension towards the colonies, very much evident where Ireland is concerned, London versus Dublin. Um, and of course, the obverse of the colonial con connection, the colonial nexus, is the post-colonial angst. And very, uh, very much this has been a theme, especially with literary scholars, that Irish literature, Irish culture, um, exhibits all, that, all the elements of post-colonial cringe, that, that is having got rid of the mother country, we spend our time aping the manners and mannerisms of the mother country, and are sort of a, a very defensive posture. The English language newspapers, the English newspapers, which are filled, uh, fill the newsstands here, English television programmes, support for English, t English, TV, uh, English football teams, and so on. All of which would sort of seem to classify us as very much in a post-colonial mode. Hence the, the whole idea of a colonial nexus and from the medieval period on up, to, on up through the 19th century. And then the post-colonial sort of period, um, post-colonial outlook, I think that offers, again, that sort of broad sweeping theme which can be investigated against the available evidence, which can be interrogated um, throughout with, with the available evidence. There are problems with this as well, and some people will know I've been unhappy with this notion of a colonial nexus being the be-all and end-all, the central theme in modern Irish history. Um, the, the problem is, I think, that well, from a constitutional point of view, Ireland is a kingdom for most of from 1541 on down to, I suppose, to the declaration of a republic. So for like nearly 400 years, Ireland is a kingdom. And kingdoms are not colonies. That's, they, they cannot, you cannot have a kingdom which is a colony. Ireland has a parliament from, for, from the 14th century on. It's a parliament which meets fitfully and then more regularly in the 18th century. But colonies don't have parliaments. That's the key point as well. Colonies have assemblies. They have... Uh, they have uh, uh, various sort of representative bodies, Massachusetts General Court, the Virginia House of Burgesses, but not the Virginia Parliament or the Massachusetts Parliament. Ireland has a peerage. This may seem to be really apropos of nothing, but there's no Massachusetts peerage, there's no Virginia peerage, there's no Duke of Virginia or Earl of Massachusetts like the Duke of Leinster, etc. etc. These are these points may not seem important, but it, precision is necessary rather than just throw out the notion of a colonial connection and sort of assume that it will float without careful def definition of what exactly is involved with describing Ireland as a colony and the relationship between England and Ireland as a colonial nexus. I think it has to be carefully probed before you go for that. Other points, of course, is that, as people pointed out, Ireland is too close, too close to England to be a colony. And the, the metropolitan condescension visited on, the, on Ireland, is it any different from that visited on the Scots or the Welsh or on the Cornish or the Yorkshire? Is it not just home county condescension visited on anyone who's not from the metropolis? These are sort of worrying aspects of the simple ac ac acceptance of a, colon a colony. There is a further one, and that is that While Ireland may exhibit some of the characteristics of a colony at certain periods, in the 12th, 13th century and so on, the 18th century, the 19th century perhaps, she also exhibits way more, I think, elements of being a mother country in her own right. And what I'm trying to say there is that any history of Ireland which, which attempts to ignore or play down Ireland's involvement in empire is bound to come up short, I think, on the available evidence. That is, Ireland's role in imperial matters, not as a, an oppressed colony, but as a willing partner in imperial activities, I think that 
helps get the 19th century, for example, moving rather briskly. To ignore that because we are uncomfortable with the notion of empire, isn't, it's nothing to do with my, it's not my business, that's the way it was in the 19th century. And a casual glance will see that Ireland very much embraced the whole imperial project. Um, leave aside the 18th century, if you wish, because of the Irish troops very much involved in the East India Company in the 18th century. But in the 19th century, Ireland does embrace the whole, as I say, imperial project of England. Ireland benefits from, from empire so far as jobs and careers are concerned. The increasing after Catholic emancipation, the Catholic demand for access to positions can only be met by, what, by using what was known quite brutally as the colonial patronage. That is to say, there simply weren't jobs to go around for all these newly qualified Catholics. Very many of them would find an outlet for their energies, their intelligence, their whatever, in the, in the colonies. And this was a deliberate strategy of the British government. Large numbers of Irish soldiers, engineers, out in, out in the colonies. Um, very much the Queen's University, the Queen's Colleges, were in a sense forcing houses for imperial administrators. They weren't educating people just to be graduates. They, were, they had wide syllabuses where they had um, Sanskrit and Hindu and ge geography of India and so on would be taught to would-be imperial administrators. Look at the Catholic Church, its missionaries go out there in their thousands. Look at Cardinal Cullen's correspondence. Cardinal Cullen seemingly has conceived a notion of spreading Catholicism throughout the British Empire throughout the 19th century, late 19th century. He is in, he's in touch and contact with very many um, bishops um, throughout the British Empire, the White Empire especially. And it's, it seems clear, though it's scarcely believable, but what he seems to be planning is to Catholicise the British Empire so that the British Empire in turn will re-Catholicise England. That this was his grand plan. And to look at the number of appointments which he made um, throughout the British Empire, from Melbourne um, through Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, um, quite an extraordinary influence wielded by Cullen. And like that, this is all part of the imperial project to which Ireland signed up. Now, the key question for a historian looking at for the broad sweep is where does it all go wrong? That is to say, the Irish were in love with the empire, in my view, but they fall out of love with the empire by the late 19th century. And that's a major question which would need to be uh, interrogated in order to sort of set the context for uh, the independence movement in the early 20th century. I don't think it's en enough to say that independence was inevitable or that there was a, a strong demand for armed insurrection or anything of that sort, up to 1914 it couldn't have been forecast. Um, it, if anything, armed insurrection would have pro probably been more likely in Belfast rather than Dublin. But nonetheless, this is the way the, the empire, once the bonds of empire begin to unravel, um, then I think the bond with England begins to unravel dramatically as well. And I think that, that would be one of the themes which I would try to address in, in, this, in, the, in my book.